me, I like to talk about me because I'm an agnostic and also because it gives you context to actually understand how I see things. So I am an engineer from France, so I basically to make it very simple, I'm not very good in technical stuff and I'm quite good at big picturing stuff. Well, that's half true because I've been doing a lot of technical things since I left school, but that's how I, um, where, where I come from. Other thing, after my school, I joined a team who was dedicated about open source. We were providing both support and expertise about open source technologies, which include free software. And during those four years in this team, I became a committer on PMD project, which is a Java tool, and also became a main contributor to XRadar. And finally, in like two years ago, I was in, um, I became involved into the Mercurial community by translating the HD book into French. At last, I'm still teaching at my old school, so the school I graduated from, which is called ESME Soloya, and I'm teaching build technologies and OP programming. So I'm kind of in the middle of like industries, but also school. <laughs> so yeah, that's it. Uh, well, quickly, this is just the ad. I'm working for a company called Number Four Now, which is uh, situated in Berlin. So if you want to do cool stuff in Berlin, you can apply. We are recruiting. That's done. Okay, first thing, this, this talk is called Scala Expressiveness, which is kind of, kind of weird, so let's just think about what expressiveness means. For other people, expressiveness is about writing small code. Like, yeah, I can write my code on, on this bottle of water. That's cool. That may be cool, but it's not really expressiveness. Expressiveness is how much your code conveys your, the idea behind it. So for instance, if you look at the first code example, Python against Java, well, clearly, Python is more concise, but also it brings you more expressiveness because like, you just say, I want a range going from three to, to minus five by a step of minus two, which is kind of making sense. If you look at this thing here, well, you can figure out what it means, but it's going to take a while. Now, other, option, other comparison, Python against Perl. Well, Python against this way of doing this in Perl. I guess there is a better way to do that. Um, same thing again, if you look at Python, uh, it's maybe somehow a bit more longer than the one in Perl, but it's kind of coming more sense. It's more easy to understand what's happening here than here. Also, because Python is a compiled type system, on this, uh, this thing is actually, well, uh, because Python is actually handling regex as like compiled thing, you can compile this expression and reuse your regex, which you can do with Perl which also bring you more expressiveness. The idea is not to say, to say that Python is better than Perl, Java, or whatever. The idea is also that depending on what you're doing, expressiveness of a language may change. So that's, that was a little introduction about this. So what does it really bring us? I mean, why do we seek or not expressiveness in long programming languages? Well, the first thing is high level of abstraction. It, we always seek for high level abstraction, otherwise we will still be playing with the no, assembler system. Uh, this, of course, brings us a more easy way to express ourselves because we, the more higher level we are, the less we have to take care about little things behind. So if you are writing web services, for instance, you don't want to worry about network connection, TCP IP error, or this kind of stuff. You just want to write your web services and just hopefully create something that's working over the web. Also, we want to have expressiveness because basically we, we wrote less code. And the thing is that the less we wrote code, the less we expose ourselves to bugs. If we go back to the, other, to the big sample of Java code we had just shown, there is many ways to get something wrong here. We can put plus one instead of plus two, we can change a sign. The Python way with this range function is more efficient and less prone to, to bug. And of course, the more your code conveys sense, the more your code is expressive, well, the less it's readable. And it's far more better to spend three hours writing three lines of code rather than spend like one hour writing like a huge bunch of code. It's going to be quite difficult to read after a while. So let's start with the first example. No, not yet. Yeah, no, first, first Scala. So a little bit about Scala. I don't know how much people here know about this language. So basically, it's running over the GVM. So it's like rotten in, in Java and run over Java. I guess there is port now. I mean, there is port like you can run Scala over, I think, Mono on some other languages, but whatever. Basically, this language is like 
providing you with OOP programming languages. You can have classes, you can have inheritance, polymorphism, methods, this kind of stuff. But it's also mixing functional programming, which means that you have closer, you have, uh, well, function as a first class citizen, this kind of thing. Which makes Scala a very, very rich and complex syntax. Basically, I think Scala can even kick its ass to C++. And I mean, this is already very complex. Well, we will see when we are going to see to the code that Scala has a very, very yeah, many, many keywords and stuff like that. But also, it's still a strongly typed languages. It's not like Groovy, which is like not, not type. It's still strongly typed, and it's also helping you by, inf by using inference. Basically, it's trying to deduce the type of the current values or, or variable. So you'll have to do this thing that we also see in Java, like list, string, uh, um, equal, new, array list, string. No, you just write val equal new list, and it's going to be able to say, okay, you just want to create a new val, which is a list. And because you put string into the list, it's a list of string. So it's going to deduce, basically, the typing, which really helps you because you can just leave out all this typing stuff and still have the benefit of typing, at least if you believe in typing. Well, some people don't, so whatever. Okay, first example. Uh, well, this is kind of obvious. You have like this classical Podro classes of Java, so you got like all your private stuff, public met method to get access to things, or get your setters, you got this equal method you need to write, you got this hash method, method you need to write, you got this public to string you need to write because those are badly done by default in Java. And you got in Scala, <laughs> this is what we call cast class. Cast class is basically going to, do, going to do all of that for you first time around, correctly. I guess expressiveness is, is kind of abuse. I mean, you just wrote four lines and you really know what you have. Um, and again, you can see that it's still strongly type. I mean, this returning is string, those are string. We are not having like a groovy or a typeless language. Okay, next example. Uh, pattern matching makes it safer. As you can see, well, this is like an example of how to handle branching a code in Java. Well, given, uh, to be truthful, this is a bad example. One can do better in Java. I hope you are seeing stuff because the red thing is not really, well, whatever. So, basically you got this huge if statement where you are doing stuff like if my list is not empty, get this thing and equal to that thing and blah, 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 blah. Okay, so that's crappy and basically you can either have a special case, a valid result or a partial result. At the end you just print a message. Here, you got this case statement which is very uh, pretty powerful in Scala because this case statement is allow you to actually match against type. So if you just pass to the case statement a valid list with the content you expect, like one and two, it's going to go to no hop. If you pass a list with two and four, it's going to go to valid result. And if you pass something else on a list, it's just going to go to the default case. Which means that if somehow you end up passing a list of the wrong type, of the wrong number of element, of the whatever you want, instead of having a big exception, instead of having things crashing, it's just going to go to the default case. Which makes your case statement far more resilient than this one. If I pass a null, a null pointer to this one, I will just get at some point a, a null pointer exception. I guess, I'm not that sure, but if I pass a null pointer or more exactly an array containing the wrong number, the wrong kind of list, I'm going to go to the default case. <coughs> Again, what Scala brings us here is not really about concisions, but really about expressing clearly what I want to do. Next one. I hope I'm going too quickly about this, about this thing. XML, I mean, he, who here has already, I mean, I guess everybody here has already wrote some kind of XML parser and get like fed up with this. I mean, you know, this, especially in Java when you have this complex document object create and then you have this bizarre error and you have to create the uh, subtrees, document node, this is, like, this is hell. And uh, frankly, it's made, it made XML like a pain in the ass. And it's a shame because XML used to be fun. I mean, back then, like 10 years ago. Well, in Scala, XML is like a first class citizen also, like for the functional function. So you can basically write XML into Scala code and just, it's just going to return to you a 
type of um, data type of XML. So you can say val XML equal some XML code and you got a variable which is typed by XML. So you can add XML stuff together, you can merge XML stuff together, you can basically handle XML like a data type, like integer, string, whatever. Also, it's quite efficient. I mean, you can write this, this thing directly and just, 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 you've got this special syntax to pass value inside it. One could argue this is like mixing data model with programming, blah, 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 but frankly, I don't think it is. One cool thing also, if you, if you just notice, and again, this is red, so nobody's saying anything, but encoding is here, which means that you don't really care about encoding up until the end. You just write your XML, you have XML data binding, and when you are actually going to print this out of the memory, like in the file or in the network, at this point, you take care of encoding which I found to be a good way to do it. Um, well, this is nice, but to be very, to be truthful, XML support in Scala has some limitation and it can be quite tricky. You can't really order the way you want to attribute. You may have another time doing complex thing. You have no XSD validation, so you have, you have to basically wrap some kind of Java object to do that. So it's not perfect, but it really gives you a way to quickly deal with XML. I mean, in simple case, very quickly and efficiently. And also, again, going back to the expressiveness, it means that if you have an issue with this thing, when you're going to open the, open the code, we'll just like, really have, we're going to have like a template of your XML file, not like DOM object with some add and, I don't know, with some set attribute thingy, which is not very really clear. We're going to see directly what you are, what, what you are fixing. One more example, which is quite famous. Uh, this one is about ending lists, and we all know because we are all doing, we are all developers that ending list is mostly what we do. I mean, we just create anything, any program is going to be ending lists, this of stuff. And this famous example is that it was done by Martin Odersky, which is a Scala creator. So it's quite famous, and it's really, I think it really shows you how much Scala can be concise and most, most important, expressive. So I just create a list here of person. So I create person. Person are already defined on the first line. This is the case, the case class. So like in the first example, with one line I can define a new object. So then I create a list of person. I don't have to type person because person is a list. A list I fill with person. So Scala is able to deduce that this list is a list of person. If I try to add something else than a person here, I'm going to have a compilation error. And then I'm going to create a new, well, actually new, two, two new lists, older and younger. Those two new lists are going to be partition from the person list. And I'm going to pass to the partition method a function. This is a function, the thing here. So the underscore dot age um, superior equal 18 is a function. And the partition method is going to use this function to actually create two sublists. One will be younger, one will be older. Now just close your eyes and think about doing the same thing in Java code. Okay, scary thing. Well, I guess you can also think about it in other languages. I mean, it will be like very, very long and there will be like a, like a ton of, ton, tons of way things can go wrong. Uh, also, yeah? When the partition returns, does it return a list? Or does it return a list when there's more than one and just one when there's one? Very good question. Yeah, uh, when partition return, does it return one list or two list? I'm kind of shady about how this thing that actually. Yeah, I'll repeat the, I just repeat the question. Yeah. I'm kind of shady about how this was going. Oh, crap. Well, this was like the last example, so I'm lucky. And I was going to say, do you have any question? But that was done. Yeah, so I can just, just conclude, and then I can come back on the question. Conclusion is, there is a lot of noise in the Scala world about like Scala is too complex, Scala is like horrible to see. I guess it's not the point here. The point is that does Scala provide you the correct explicitly you need to? So, if you want to retain something of this old show, just retain that. Thank you for listening, and enjoy the first demo.